Let's dive in. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, and it would be a good idea if you did, either uh, uh, a, a Luddite version, a printed version, or on your phone, an app would be great. If you want to have a Bible to open with you, we have a Bibles on the table at the back there. You could grab one and have it with you. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15. We are continuing on in our series. We've been about a year and a half on and off through the Gospel of Luke, which is what we like to do, we go through books of the Bible here at the church. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. Uh, we took a break now. It's a couple of weeks. So I got to give you a little bit of a recap. I know you just love Glenn's recaps because, you know, it just extends the time of the sermon. But, but we need to, I think, go back and just have a, a little look at a couple of things. So we're following on immediately, if you remember, from two weeks ago, uh, where we read uh, at the end of chapter 14. And if you remember, Jesus was on the road again. He was leaving one meal. And on the road, there was a great crowd of people following him. And uh, he's on his way to another meal that we arrive at today. So there's this great crowd, great crowd, like thousands of people. When the language is used that way, it means like thousands. And, and as he's walking along, all of a sudden he, he turns around and he immediately launches in to this really challenging set of assertions saying, if you don't do this, you cannot be my disciple. Oh, and by the way, if you don't do this, you cannot be my disciple. Oh, one more thing. If you do not do this... You cannot be my disciple. That silenced the crowd. Basically, what he was saying is, if you make anyone, mother, father, children, wife, spouse, anyone in relationship with you more important than me, you cannot be my disciple. And then he goes on and he adds our stuff. If you make you know, your house, your money, your possessions, your career, anything like that, more important than me, you cannot be my disciple. And then finally, he winds it all up with, oh, and by the way, if you uh, are more concerned about your own life than me, you cannot be my disciple. Well, our takeaway from that really challenging series, now you can imagine the crowd, right? Great silence, don't you think? Right? Standing there listening to that. But we took away some, I think, really encouraging things from that. First of all, he's just, he's making it very clear. Listen. You must choose. Christianity is not just like, oh good, I can have Jesus on my tool belt along with everything else and it helps me. No, no, you need, you need to choose who you're going to follow in this life. Secondly, you must really think it through. You know, we've talked about this before with Jesus. It's not bait and switch. It's not, it, it's, it, no, you, you need to really think about what you're signing up for. He wants you to do that. And the passage showed us that. But finally, he's also talking to the Christian where he's saying, listen, you need to finish well. So you need to follow me all of your life. At the end of it all, and what most people I think miss is what Jesus was really getting at is this. Is he's getting at, look, what I have for you in this life, let alone eternity, is way better than anything that you can accomplish on your own. That's really what he's getting at. It's not about, about, well, you know, the cost of, you've got to give up all the good things. No, what he wants to give to us in this life are all the better things, which of course includes him. I said it at the end of the message on that Sunday. We need to hear the words, you cannot be my disciple, more like this, which is really his intention. He's really saying, listen, you cannot have all of me. All of my forgiveness and my love for you, all of my salvation, all of my way, my life, all of my eternal blessings and possessions that I'm going to inherit, which I'm going to give to you, you cannot have all of those things unless I have all of you. Unless I'm Lord of your life, rather than you being Lord of your life or someone else, or something else. And so that brings us up to date, to where we are today. It may be a day or so later. We don't know for sure. The way Luke orders his account is awesome. But it appears to be a day or so later. And they arrive in the next town. Luke continues with a series of parables that Jesus gives after being at this meal. He's basically critiqued or criticized by, of course, the religious dudes, the Pharisees. 
who are grumbling together, and he launches into a set of three parables. We'll look at two of them this Sunday, and next Sunday we'll look at one that you all know, the prodigal, right? That's the third one in this series, so that's important for us to remember as we go into it. It's his rebuttal to what they are thinking and saying, but it's also a great lesson for us all here today. So begin reading with me in Luke chapter 15 and verse 1. We'll read 10 verses together, and then I'm going to pray one more time, and we will we'll look at this amazing word. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. So he, Jesus, told them a parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep... If he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together all of his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or, or, or what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, There is joy before the angel of God over one sinner who repents. Pray with me, would you? Uh, Father, once again, uh, we come before you this morning uh, thanking you for who you are, for what you've done for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Um, We thank you for your mercy, your grace, and your patience. Even with those who grumble at you which we all have, your patience to continually want to teach lost sinners to repent. Holy Spirit, bless us today. Speak to us. Help us to understand uh, the beautiful truth that Jesus wants to reveal to them and to us today. And I pray these things in his worthy name. Amen. Your sermon title for today is Finding Joy That Lasts. Anybody up for that? (laughs) Finding joy that lasts. Three points. It's kind of interesting. They kind of make a sentence. It wasn't intentional, but it's what it is. Point number one, sinners repenting. Number two, the lost being found. Number three, produces eternal joy. Number one, sinners repenting. Let me put the verses on screen for you. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and he eats with them. So let me ask you a question from the recap that I gave you this morning, but also from what we saw a couple of weeks ago. How many people do you think who were part of that great crowd, the multitudes that were following Jesus on that day, how many of them do you think kind of went and turned around and walked away? How many? What we've learned about crowds so far in the Gospel of Luke is, the consensus would be, most of them. Most of them turned away and walked away. This is what we've come to know. And, and, and the motivation, their motivation for following Jesus has probably been, listen, when they hear these things and they've been following him, and yes, the miracles have been great. Yes, the free you know, fish and, and loaves was awesome. Maybe there would be more of that. But at some point, most people who are following and hearing him speaking about the kingdom and what you need to do to be in the kingdom, to be saved, most of them get to the point where they're basically thinking one of two things. That's just too hard. That's too hard. Too much to ask of me. Secondly, honestly, I just don't think it's worth it. And I mean, really, I'm not that bad a person next to some of these other people. It's the mindset of the crowds. But we also read in John's Gospel some disturbing words. 
It's a different context, but the same thing applies, where it even says this in John 6, 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. This was after a different sermon in a different situation, but even those who were considered his disciples, not just the crowd, but those who would have, are you a disciple? Oh yeah, I'm a follower. Yeah. No, they turned around at some point. Listen, if you look at the gospel when Jesus is, you know, like Matthew, he comes, you know, just before he says, you know, by the way, go and make disciples, all authority has been given to me. It says right there in the text that some of them still doubted. Preaching's important. That's why Jesus kept it up. But John also records that Jesus wasn't surprised by this. Didn't surprise him at all. In fact, in John's Gospel in chapter 6, just before this verse, it, it, it tells us that Jesus knew their hearts and he actually knew the ones that would turn away and he actually knew the one who would betray him who was right there, Judas Iscariot. And yet what did he do? Still loved them still preached truth, still gave them the gospel. So now what I want you to see is this. Look at who draws near to him. Look who are the people from the crowd, all right, or, and, and from the, they probably followed to the next town or they lived in the next town. The people that actually draw near to him may have been part of the crowd, but they're probably thinking this, the tax collectors and the sinner types, they're probably thinking, well, you know, listen, um, actually, uh, I'm not really attached to too much. I'm kind of poor, but I'm not really attached to too much, and nobody's really attached to me. And, um, you know, an awful lot of what he's saying is really makes sense, and it's true about me. He seems to know my heart. And, and despite the fact that he knows my heart and that I'm a sinner, that I'm a not great person and not living the best lifestyle, he still invites me to eat with him, to be with him. And on top of that, I've got nothing to offer him whatsoever. Yes, the people who draw near to Jesus in this story and during most of his life are the tax collectors and the sinners. And of course, that's a broad, a broad group, right? That basically includes a, a number of people, including, of course, poor people who were looked down upon, women of the streets, prostitutes. I mean, it, the outcasts. The foreigners. And of course, Luke does what he does often in his gospel. He contrasts these type of people, right? the sinners, you and me, with the religious, the self-righteous, and the judgmental. That's the great contrast. I, I would also add the delusional, right? The people who can't even see the fact that they're equally sinful. So let's be sure we note this. These opening verses, these opening two verses are really important because they set up, the, they're, the, they're what Jesus responds to in each of the parables. So Jesus is responding to what we see here in each of the two parables as we go forth. It, it's in response to the picture that we see here that Jesus teaches these amazing and lovely parables. So what then do we see and hear here? Well, first at this meal, there is a group of men and women who were in the eyes of most of society, besides what I've just told you and the text tells us you are, they were looked down upon. They were considered the lowest of the low, not just by the religious guys, but by anyone in the society who considered themselves better, which was certainly those who were wealthier and religious. These are the common sinners, the poor, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, most likely, as I've said, and the like those type of people. They were the people that Jesus was eating with. And again, in the minds of the self-righteous and religious leaders, they're like, okay, wait a second. This guy is talking like he's a prophet of Israel, like he's the Messiah. And what, what doesn't he get? We, we don't eat with these kind of people. So, so in their minds, he's almost proving that there's no possible way he can be who he's supposed to be because of his behavior. We just, we just don't do these kind of things, right? Well, look again closely, though. What are these sinners doing? These sinners are, A, drawing near to Jesus. To do what? To hear him. To hear him. 
And so, friends, that is exactly what happens or, or, or should have been happening in your life, and it, I hope it has in your life, when the Holy Spirit begins to do a work in your hearts. The first thing is, is that you're drawn to not a gathering, not to a preacher, not to, you know, some religion. You're drawn to this person who claimed to be the Son of the God, the Son of God in the flesh, who died on the cross for you. You're drawn to him. And then, then you want to hear him. That's why we do this on Sunday morning, is to focus on him. He's the hero of the story, and he's the one we need to hear from. And so it's when we do this that we begin to realize the truth of our own sin. The more we hear from him, and we're not thinking it's the pastor, the preacher, or our friend judging us. No, he, he's not even judging us. He's not condemning us. He's offering us grace, forgiveness. Well, not the Pharisees. They neither draw near to Jesus, nor do they hear him, do they? No, why? Because they're off in the corner, you know, not actually at the dinner table, but probably just outside the window or in the corner, and they're grumbling to themselves. A little like, like people who like to preferably, rather than come to a gathering and draw near to Jesus and hear about him, they'd rather rant on Facebook about him. <laughs> and the church, how awful and evil and, right? Religious, self-righteous, Pharisees. Finally, before we move on to the first parable, we should also highlight two things. First, it's obvious, obvious, right? Who Jesus receives. Sinners. Aren't you glad? That's who he receives. Not perfect people or people who think they're perfect. That's whom he receives. He receives sinners. And secondly, although it will require us looking at these parables that follow to see this, we're all, the message here is, we're all lost sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, including those who think self-righteously that they're good enough, because they're not. And of course, the requirement for all of us is repentance. It's interesting, you look at the words in the passage, and I was going to highlight it earlier, but you got sinners, repent, lost, found, Family, neighbors, rejoice, joy. Keywords. You might want to listen later just to write those down. So that's point number one. Number two, the lost are found. Let's look at the first parable. So he told them this parable. <clears throat> what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? So a couple things that we should note right away. Jesus heard and knows the heart of the Pharisees. Now he's having a meal with these people that he actually receives. and he, he's, It's a lovely meal. He's having a good time with them. There's wine, you know, there's Merlot, and there's bread, and there's good food. And they're having a good time. But he hears these guys. He hears. And yet, he still decides to take the time to speak to them so that what? They might hear him. It's amazing. And that's why he opens the parable with the words, what man, right? Because so, he's speaking directly to them. What's also interesting is this. In the first parable, he tells them a story of another type of man whom, would have, whom they also would have had zero respect for. What man is that? A shepherd. Another one of the lowest of the lows, right? These were poor men. They were you know, they foul language, they never came to synagogue, you know, like they didn't come to church, right? Um, they, they just, they, they had their own way of doing things, they were dirty, messy, just not our kind, they were unclean for sure, right? They just weren't our types. So you'll remember, uh, going back to our Gifts of God series, however, that we spent one Sunday looking at the gift of shepherds, right? That who Jesus gives to the church. Well, one lesson from that series was this, we're all sheep, we're all sheep, and we're all sheep who need a shepherd. We also learned that they were not the career choice of most Jews, obviously, because they were low down on the food chain, especially the self-righteous and religious type. They were considered low, but they're exactly who Jesus uses here in this parable to illustrate his point, which is, which is this. Sheep, of which all of you are, all of us are, get lost. They get lost. 
And the good news is there's a good shepherd who goes to look for his lost sheep. Now, all of these men who are listening to Jesus would have agreed, they would have understood that, yeah, well, because if I was in the same situation, if I was a farmer, a wealthy farmer, who had several thousand sheep, and I lost even one, I'd go looking for it. Don't want to end it up on my neighbor's property and let it increase his herd. I want that back, right? They would do that. They would understand that. So the parable's working on them. They're getting this. They're like, okay, yeah, good with, with you so far. But there's another thing that they should have known. And I've been quoting this verse a few times in the past week as we've been going through what we've been going through as a church family. They would have also known Psalm 23, wouldn't they? The Lord is my shepherd. They would have known that. So, so shepherd or shepherd seem to be missing missing the point considerably, to say the least. They would have known that. They should hear Jesus saying, listen men, you are also lost. And you need to be found. And you too need to repent. That's the lesson so far. Jesus goes on, and when he, this man, has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So for those of you who are not familiar with caring for sheep, the truth is, and we looked at this before, but the truth is they're not good with directions. When they get lost, they're lost. (laughs) They're not, they don't have a homing beacon like certain animals, right? They will not find their way back. They will die of starvation or they will be eaten by wolves, by prey. But also, this is true, when you find them as a shepherd, it's interesting, you know, if your dog gets lost, right? We got a dog, she gets lost every once in a while, it's tragic. But anyway, when you find your dog and you, then you finally go, come on, let's go home, Gracie, come on, let's go, right? Well, they immediately start to head home, don't they? And the closer you get to home, they just take off ahead of you and they sit at the front door going, I'm sorry for running away, I'm good, please give me a treat, right? Well, that's what Gracie does, maybe. But dogs do that, not sheep. Sheep don't do that. So what the shepherd actually has to do, the shepherd has to bind up their feet, throw them over his shoulder, or around his shoulders, around his neck, and carry them home. That's the picture (laughs) from God's perspective of what he has done for you and for me. Sheep are hopeless when they're lost. Hopeless. They need to be carried home. So let's now consider the response of the shepherd. Once he gets that sheep up as in his shoulders, and, and what does he do? Right away, as soon as he's got the sheep all tied up and he's heading home, he's rejoicing. He's really glad. He's happy, right? And, and then when he gets home, the, the, the first thing he wants to do is call together all of his friends. He wants to have a party to celebrate that what was lost has been found. And you, like, thank you for praying for me and praying that I'd find my sheep. And I did. And so let's have a party. And he calls his friends to all rejoice together. Here's the lesson, verse 7. Jesus says to these men, Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. I wish we could be flies on the wall in that room at that time. Because, you know, you and I read these words and we hear this and we're like, they would not have liked this. It's very direct. They hopefully would have gotten Jesus' point. So he drops it on them and we need to see exactly how. He says, well, if you think that's a great story, and it is, and a great happy ending, let me tell you what's better than that. He tells them that there is more, keyword, more joy in heaven over one Sinner who repents than over 99 righteous who need apparently no repentance. We'll come back to that. Parable number two. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, seek diligently until she finds it? 
uh, this is awesome. It's really good. Again, culturally, you'd have to be there to really get the picture. But, um, you know, you just what man, right? And, and, and now woman, so girls, ladies, sorry, but you're sinners too, right? So you're included in this package of teaching. But what's more important is th- that you need to understand that for them, there's a couple of things going on here. Number one, most Pharisees would pray, oh Lord, thank you for not making me a Gentile or a woman. Most Pharisees and scribes and religious men in that day actually did not believe women could be saved or were worth saving. That's pretty harsh, right? They were in the same league as most men are with the tax collectors, the lowest of the low. What's even more interesting here is is that that this person, this woman, uh, they know by the story that this woman was probably very poor. Why? Because she's got 10 coins. She's got 10 coins. It's her dowry. It's not very much. And because she's missing one, she, she has to find it, which tells them, again, she's poor. So she's a woman and she's poor. And that's why finding her lost coin is a big deal for her. And what's the response? Well, in verses 9 and 10, And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, Jesus says, I tell you, there is joy before the angels over God, uh, of God over one sinner who repents. So really the same situation in this parable. Um, we see she searches for the lost coin. She finds it. She calls her friends and neighbors and family together. They have a party. They rejoice together. It's a big celebration. It's an awesome deal. It's a wonderful thing. And we also see here that it's not just joy in heaven, more joy in heaven, but it's before the angels of God. So like there's a multitude of angels rejoicing with God, having joy with God. There's a party going on up there that outstrips anything down here. It's remarkable what's going on. And what we see here, it's really, really quite beautiful. So we've studied many, listen, of of Jesus' parables before, and we've learned that Jesus used... Uh, them often to uh, teach us great lessons about uh, primarily who God is, what he's done, uh, what he's doing, about the kingdom of God, but most, mostly about ourselves, about who we are. And based on that, what then we need to do. Someone once said that the parables of Jesus have essentially one big idea. I agree, they have one big idea. And we're going to get to that. We'll close with that one big idea. But first, I want to highlight one more time for us the key lessons here today. We've seen them throughout this, but I want to highlight them for you. First, as we've seen and we've heard this morning, sinners are drawn to Jesus. It's so important. Friend, they go hand in hand. To, To want to or even feel the need to be drawn to Jesus is is the beginning of realizing that, yeah, you're less than perfect. (laughs) You're broken, we're broken, we're sinners. That's the first step in us getting there. You all know, or you should know, that we are all sinners, as I've said, and, and these are, we are sinners who need to repent and receive the forgiveness that Jesus offers for our sins. We need the free gift of salvation. We can't earn it that he offers. We also know that salvation involves a, a number of steps. It's, yes, the first step and most important step is we need salvation from the very penalty of our sins, right? There's a cost to what we have done. There's a price that needs to be paid. The judgment is our lives. Good news, Jesus stood in our place. He took our sin. So we're saved from the the penalty of sin, but also, friends, we know this. The gospel is necessary for life as a Christian. Why? Because we need to be continually saved from what? The power of sin over us that still exerts its pressure on us in this world today. We're still in the flesh. So, friend, Christian, you need to continually draw near to Christ. You need to continually hear him. Yes, your pastor is going to tell you. You need to continually open your Bible daily, draw near to Jesus Christ, 
and hear him for yourself. And that's why, again, why we do this is to draw near to him and hear from him. Secondly, we must, everyone must avoid the biggest problem that the religious Pharisees had. It's tied to what I just said, but it is this. They didn't understand their need for Jesus. And why? Well, first of all, the scribes and Pharisees did not hear Jesus. They did not listen to him. And why again? Because they didn't think they needed him. They thought that he needed to think the the way they did about what it took to get to God. They think and thought he had it backwards. They had it backwards. When Jesus says in this passage, when he says the words, heaven rejoices more over one sinner who repents than 99 of the righteous who don't need repentance, do you think, are we to think that Jesus is saying there are people in the world who are righteous enough in themselves and don't need to repent? Hardly. Hardly, right? No. Do you think he's saying there are people in the world who don't think they need to repent And who do think they are righteous? Uh Uh-huh. Yes. For sure. There are people in this world who don't think they need Jesus. Why don't they repent? Simply put, they don't believe they need to. I'll let the chips fall where they may. My good will outweigh my... No, it won't. Sadly mistaken. One last great lesson would be this. We see in action in these parables is the unrelenting, come on, we see in this parable, both of them, but also in the whole of the Gospels, the unrelenting pursuit of God, mercy and grace of God for the whole world. It's just, it's all over the text. He wants to find you. He he goes looking for the lost. That's why he sent his son. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. So, Let's now look at our final point for today and the big idea in this parable. And it's our point number three, which is eternal joy. Let me start by asking a question. What gives you joy? Today. Yesterday. Next week. What what gives you joy? Now, I I I thought about it. It would be probably pretty easy. We'd we'd probably share some common lists of things, right? Things that we we would say, that gives me joy. Right? Like there's some of you today are looking outside at the sun, which I'm doing right now, going, that gives me joy. <laughs> a sunny, warm day that you actually have the time to go and enjoy and walk up a mountain and look around at God's beautiful creation. Does that give you joy? That's why he did it, by the way. That's why he provided it for us. Yeah, that gives us joy. But also simple things like, come on, good food, a good meal with family and friends, healthy family, babies. Marriage. There's a lot of things that give us joy. And, and, and the big events in our lives, they, they give us joy. And, and, and the thing that we need to understand about that is that's natural. That's because God wants us to be joyful. Everything that we have, everything that is good in this life is given to us for our joy by Him. So His purpose is that we would be joyful people. But the truth is, and I think we've all seen this well this week, there are great valleys, right, in this life. Sometimes the valleys are long and very wide. And sometimes it can feel like those mountaintop experiences. I just, that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. So the big idea in these parables is intended, I believe, to give us, listen, hope. We need it. Great hope that our God truly wants us to experience great joy. It's it's rather subtle in the text here today. I don't want to press it too much, but I hope you'll see it to be true. I want to show you this. We, you and I in this world today, we're rejoicers. You notice that in the text? It's in the text. Every time something is found, they do what? They rejoice. So we're rejoicers. Why are we rejoicers? Because we lose our joy. Circumstances, life, loss, we lose our joy. So we need to re-up our joy, which is where we get the word rejoice. But I don't believe that's the way it is in heaven. 
Now, I know in some of your Bibles even, or in some books you've read, you, that you, you'll, over this text, you'll, heaven rejoices. I'm actually not sure about that. In this way, please hear me. Let me put the words back on screen for you from verse 7 and verse 10. Look what it says. Jesus said, just so I tell you, there will be what? More joy or more rejoicing? No, more joy in heaven when one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous. And then in verse 10 he goes, just so I tell you there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And so I, I think what we should see is this. The picture is this. Heaven is perpetual joy. It's, it's perpetual joy. The only thing that's happening in heaven when one of us repents, a sinner repents and comes to faith in Christ, is there's more. Can you imagine there being more and more and more? And never, ever a valley and the need to rejoice. I want to suggest to you that's our, our big takeaway from that today finding lasting joy is found there. So in conclusion, let me answer the question that may be on your mind at this point. Will we find joy that lasts in this life? Answer, obviously, should be, I don't think so. I think we can hold it in our hearts, and I think we need to remind each other of this eternal joy, this everlasting joy, and we can certainly find ways to experience it. But the truth is we're, we're still living in this, this world plagued by evil, by sin, by death, by suffering, by pain. And so we're going to need that rejoicing. But one day it will change. And Jesus actually told us, by the way, he actually gave us a great hint as to how we might be able to, even today, find joy that lasts and lasts. And his hint was, ask for it. Do you remember when his disciples asked him, how do we pray? Well, he opened with these words. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He knows when we suffer. He knows when we need to rejoice. And he wants to give us that joy. We need to ask him for that. Friends, we too can experience this joy that Jesus in heaven experiences when, listen, when we find our joy in the same things that he does. I asked you just a minute ago, what do you find your joy in? What gives you joy? How about sin is repenting, the lost being found? That's what we're called to go and do. Pray with me, would you?